Since the invention of the printing press, there's been a battle to control disseminated information. In the early 1900s, oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller took control of every newspaper and news editor of his era. He became America's first billionaire, paving the way for the power hungry ever since. Thus began the gold rush for the modern world's most precious resource, the narrative. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA who are contributing to a major circulation American journal? During a Senate committee investigation, it was revealed that the CIA had been conducting a covert operation to infiltrate and control U.S. media. They called it Operation Mockingbird. We do have people who submit pieces to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in an executive session. Over 3,000 CIA contracted and trained operatives were placed in key positions within top media outlets. Posing as editors and journalists, these well-paid actors never dared to question the effect of their lies on the world beyond their cozy studio. How often does the CIA manipulate the media in this way? It goes beyond your wildest imagination. Setting up student organizations so they could draw radical students in, 5,000 university professors co-opted to help the CIA manipulate people's minds. Journalists in the U.S., including big-name journalists, co-opted to function routinely to help the CIA put out stories and biases to the world. As this 1952 CIA memo says, the aim is controlling an individual to the point where he will do our bidding against his will. It's a great brainwashing process to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. Would you say that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations, I think you've got to be much more careful about it. So how do we know that Operation Mockingbird still isn't in effect? Well, we don't. It was the Telecommunications Act of 1996 that opened the door for predatory corporations to monopolize the industries of print and broadcast. This bill protects consumers against monopolies. It guarantees the diversity of voices. Today, a handful of corporate empires own and control the vast majority of everything you read, hear, and watch. From the biggest movie studios, television and radio networks, newspapers and magazines, to the vast universe of internet news and entertainment sites. Amazon has transformed its operations in response to COVID-19 to protect employees and keep packages flowing. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy while still delivering those packages to the company is keeping its employees safe and healthy while still delivering those packages to the company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. The company is keeping its employees safe and healthy. Millions of Americans staying at home. Millions of Americans staying at home. And that is how it works. It's like a house of mirrors, where you're seeing the same thing over and over and over again, except it's distorted. There's an industry that is paid to go after and target journalists, whistleblowers, and inundate our consciousness and the images we see to try to ruin, destroy, or smear the idea that they don't like or the person who's delivering it. You smear somebody with falsehoods and all the rest, and then you merchandise it. And then you write it, and they'll say, see, it's reported in the press, so they have that validation that the press reported the smear, and then it's called the wrap-up smear. Now I'm gonna merchandise the press's report on the smear that we made. And it's, it's a tactic. Welcome back, everybody. News personalities are not the only high-paid actors to serve the propaganda machine. Most late-night talk shows are owned by the same corporate overlords and thus follow the same script only laced with a laugh. Our main story tonight concerns conspiracy theory. Last week tonight with John Oliver featured a skit entitled Coronavirus Conspiracy Theories. Like the claim that the moon landing was faked. First thing to note here is that Mr. Oliver opens with commentary about conspiracy theories 
that are completely unrelated to coronavirus. This is a standard tactic used by propagandists to set a tone so that anything that follows will be seen through the lens of absurdity. Plandemic, a pseudo-documentary filled with a hodgepodge of conspiracy theories. Mr. Oliver then does his best to debunk Dr. Judy's claim that she was arrested but never charged with a crime. She was absolutely criminally charged. This was not an oversight, but a blatant lie. Prior to the taping of this episode, Mr. Oliver had the official arrest documents that clearly proved that Dr. Judy was never charged with a crime. Mr. Oliver then attempts to debunk the idea that a beach, aka nature, holds any value in boosting our body's natural immune system. Instead of challenging the point with science, he kills it with a smear. Everything that you just said is insane. Television is not the truth. We do it in illusions, man. None of it is true. But you people sit there day after day, night after night, all ages, colors, creeds. We're all you know. You're beginning to believe the illusions we're spinning here. You're beginning to think that the tube is reality and that your own lives are unreal. This is mass madness, you maniacs. In God's name, you people are the real thing. We are the illusion. So turn off your television sets, turn them off now, turn them off right now, turn them off and leave them off, turn them off right in the middle of the sentence I'm speaking to you now, turn them off. In 1979, the world decided that we needed the Bayh-Dole Act because we needed to reform our patent system. And one of the modifications was we allowed recipients of federal funding to patent and retain economic interest in the research that the public paid for. You get a $5 million grant from the taxpayer, and then you get to charge the taxpayer a premium for the technology they paid to develop. Pfizer is going to get nearly $2 billion. Moderna receiving $438 million in taxpayer money. And yet both companies have said they will not sell the vaccine at cost. They're going to make a profit on it. Should pharmaceutical companies profit off this vaccine research that taxpayers have helped fund. And the Bayh-Dole Act failed the American people because rather than standing on the shoulders of giants, we now kneel at the feet of greed. My systems flagged anomalies when I started seeing nonprofits and corporates and cover financing for coronavirus programs in the late summer and fall of 2019. Our first red flag came out when we read the world at risk scenario. Now there is an organization called the Global Monitoring Preparedness Board. This organization is a part of the World Health Organization and this board includes Dr. Elias from the Gates Foundation and Anthony Fauci from NIAID. These two individuals plus the director of the Center for Disease Control in China, come out with a recommendation that says that by September 2020, two global pandemic preparedness exercises have to be completed. And one of them has to be done on the release of a respiratory pathogen that then gave rise to an October event, Event 201, on behalf of our partners in the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Event 201 took place five months before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. The participants of the event are some of the same people that are now deeply involved in the real pandemic and profiting from it as well. Event 201 was a scripted, multi-camera live event that was broadcast globally via the internet. An event of this complexity and magnitude would take months to write, prep, and produce. Placing the conception date at least one year prior to the actual pandemic. There is no question that there will be a surprise outbreak. Anthony Fauci knew as early as January of 2017 that we would see an outbreak before the end of 2020. Even Bill Gates, a man with no medical training, knew it was coming. If we start now, we can be ready for the next epidemic. Every single thing that you have seen play out in front of your eyes, all of them laid out in their tabletop exercise, which by the way, fact checkers have said, has nothing to do with the coronavirus outbreak. Just happenstance. This is that wonderful universe of improbabilities where events just co-emerge and then nature conveniently backs itself into our architecture. 
That's, that's the scenario we're supposed to accept. Brilliant. Some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. The president has made a decision to suspend all travel to the United Kingdom and Ireland. Dis and misinformation circulating over the internet. Across the world, misinformation about the virus is being shared online. A significant demand for N95 masks and gloves are on the rise. The demand for N95 masks to prevent the deadly airborne virus has surged. We could eventually have 52 million treatment courses per year but it will take many months to get there. We're still many months out from having something that we can really deploy to the public. And 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. The new poll finds that 49% of Americans say they would get a COVID-19 vaccine should an effective one be discovered. I'm curious, who wrote the Event 201 script? The visionaries of the event knew at least one year in advance what was needed. Why didn't they take care of those things? Considering that Bill Gates has donated half of his fortune to make the world safer, why didn't he help to better prepare our hospitals and frontline workers? Why didn't any of the event's wealthy sponsors do something? Now here we are. You know, we, we didn't simulate this, we didn't practice. On behalf of our partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So both the health policies and economic policies we find ourselves in unchartered territory. Event 201 was not the first scripted exercise to prophesize the future with astonishing accuracy. Leaders of global health and business have been seeding reality with fictional scenarios for several decades. The scenario obviously is fictional. One year prior to Event 201, many of the same sponsors, hosts, and actors came together to produce a tabletop pandemic simulation for a fictional virus they branded Clade X. One year to produce a vaccine for this is too long. Uh, we should have stockpiled, we didn't, but we're gonna have to look at that vaccine question to see if we can speed up the delivery. And if we do not have the public with us, we're in big trouble. In 2010, the Rockefeller Foundation released a 54-page document called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. Page 18 features the pandemic scenario, Lockstep, a world of tighter top-down government control and authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizen pushback. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entries to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. We are living in a time where leadership unfortunately is compromised. And by that I mean, that individuals are placed in power for their ability to be influenced, not their merits of leadership. Nothing could be clearer than the leadership of the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is the institution granted exclusive power to guide and protect the health and wellness of humanity. The WHO is sustained by private donations, the bulk of which are made by pharmaceutical and biotech corporations who have a vested financial interest in the organization's support. In 2017, the Associated Press reported that the WHO routinely spends about $200 million a year on travel expenses, more than what it spends to fight some of the biggest problems in public health, including AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria combined. The WHO's repeated issuing of inaccurate and bad advice is not merely the result of incompetence, but rather the direct result of the Communist Party of China deliberately buying out WHO's leadership. On the nomination of the executive board, appoints Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus as Director General of the World Health Organization. Tedros Ghebreyesus is the World Health Organization's first Director General that isn't a medical doctor. No Tedros for WHO! No Tedros for WHO! The appointment to the organization's highest position was controversial, given that in his previous role as Ethiopian's health minister, Tedros was accused of covering up three 